Hey everybody, this is Shane Mata. Welcome back to the vlog. And today is the third episode of National Podcast Post Month, although today is the 4th of November. I missed yesterday. I just, I was just brain dead. I really could not sit down and put two thoughts together. I think the saying would be something like, uh, I didn't have two thoughts to rub together or something like that. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm back today, and I, to, today I want to talk about something a bit, I don't know if it's nostalgic or, I don't know, I suppose it's kind of historical in a way. Uh, on the screen here I have the beginning of Scorpion's The Winds of Change, or Wind of Change. Anybody who was around in the 90s would remember this beginning of this song very iconic and uh, so this was I think it was put out in 91 something like that 92 it was it was towards the end of the era in which uh, we started the or I guess the end of the Russian or not, it wasn't even Russian at that time and that's the thing about it is for for younger people you know Millennials, you, you don't re recognize or you don't really grasp because you're going to have to live through that stuff. Um, the 80s, the late 80s, after 86, 85, 86, is when Russia, sorry, I keep, I keep calling it Russia, but it, it was the Soviet Union. And so growing up, as far, far back as I remember, the Soviet Union was the, the great enemy kind of like the way China is in a way today. But I think China is a Soviet Union light in a lot of ways because they've adopted capitalism to some degree, although not completely. Uh, I think in order to save face, they do maintain a lot of control over the economy and, and the people. But for the most part, they they recognize the value of capitalism and so they've allowed it to some degree in, in China. But the Soviet Union was a totally different thing. Uh, they were really committed. And not to say the Chinese are not committed, you know. Uh, both the Russians and the Chinese, as well as the uh, Cambodians, and other places that have instituted communism have had no, no uh, qualms about murdering, you know, thousands, millions of people to get the point across that they're going to be socialist. So... In that regard, they're they're pretty equal. But in any case, the Soviet Union was the great evil empire growing up, and so I was in elementary school in the early '80s. You know, so I was lucky that you could kind of track my my grades, school grades, based on the years. So 1981, I would have been in first grade. 1982, second grade. 83, third grade, and so on. So, as you can imagine, by the time sixth grade came around, that's when the Soviet Union, or Mikhail Gorbachev, started talking about uh, Glasnost and, and Perestroika. And these were big changes to the way that, that the Soviet Union was going to operate. They essentially admitted defeat and needed to reform, so... Perestroika was the reform, and Glasnost was the social changes that I think that, that the way I understand it was social changes that happened within the country to kind of bring about a lot of these these changes to the society of the Soviet Union, and so this is around the time that the 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 Berlin Wall fell, and some of the member nations of the Soviet Union started separating, and uh, so that's why we now have Ukraine, and it's not part of the Soviet Union anymore. Is because they kind of went their separate way, uh, or at least somewhat. <laughs> so, and I think you have to understand that a lot of the countries that border the Soviet Union or the old Soviet Union are very Russian in many ways, uh, even though culturally they may not be. Well, it's kind of weird to say because... The way I, I, I see it is kind of like um, 
there's the Catholic Church all over the world. There's Catholics in Africa, and there's Catholics in you know the in the Americas, in Europe, and uh, I think in Asia there's Catholics as well. And so there are, there is a similarity in our cultures that unites us all as Catholics, for example. And at the same time, there's cultural things that unite people in their nation and with the way they do things. And I think it, that's the same way that R the Soviet Union, I keep wanting to call it Russia, is with a lot of the former member nations is that they have a shared history and a shared way of, of viewing certain things. Even though culturally they may be different, they do have that shared understanding of how things are, were and at least for that, you know, for the while that they were part of the Soviet Union. And so for somebody growing up with the threat of nuclear war looming, you know, so I, I didn't grow up with the, with the drills, having to jump under the desk in case there was nuclear fallout. But I was at an age in which there was still material available, like there were still signs, uh, the radioactive shelter signs, posted in some places very conspicuously and nobody really told us about them what they were for you kind of had to figure it out or some smart ass knew about what what it was about and would tell everybody uh, and so you see also a, a change in the way school buildings were built <laughs> they used to be really solid buildings and now they're mostly just your standard commercial construction you know uh, steel and and bricks facade and you know but in any case, uh, the point being that that I grew up at a time in which it was still the evil empire, but the threat, and so I mean, the threat was still there. There was still the possibility of nuclear war, and that we might see the end, you know, rain down upon us one day if things didn't go well. Uh, but it wasn't as intense as it may have been in the, in the 70s and perhaps even the 60s, where you know, it was things were getting kind of hot. Uh, I grew up in what was known as the Cold War. And so it was more a battle of ideas and, and gamesmanship, you know, and it was a, it was chess, basically. It wasn't checkers. <laughs> it was, and in some cases, you know, they were playing 3D chess with each other, you know, back and forth. It was spy versus spy. And that was the era in which I grew up and a lot of generation Xers, I suppose. And so I guess we could title this related to that in Generation X growing up with uh, the Soviet Union. So I think this experience growing up also shapes my opinion of of Russia today. So there was a an interview with Tucker Carlson not too long ago uh, in which Vladimir Putin talks about that the Soviet Union does not want to take over the world, that they basically have always wanted to just fit in with the rest of the of the the rest of Europe. They want to be European. They've always wanted to be European. But the Europeans have always been snobs and didn't want to give them the time of day. <laughs> uh, and this is very obvious in a lot of the historical settings in that the Russians have always been kind of pushed aside or not really considered European, uh, even though... You know the Romanovs and other families. They were, they were part of the Habsburg family. You know all that the intermarried royalty, and they spoke French in court and you know things like that. So, they've always wanted very badly to be European, and I don't think that has changed. What is uh, so? I think that the concept or the idea that that Russia wants to take over the world I think that's just in my opinion something that's made up by NATO they are pushing a narrative because there's money in defense there's money you know to be there's money to be gifted there's money to be taken there's money to be you know taxed for defense that they otherwise would not get so if there is no threat from Russia then there is no need to extract so much money from people to defend them against a threat that doesn't exist. Um, so, anyways, going back to the song, uh, this song came out at, around that, uh, towards the end of that period when it seemed like 
like democracy had won, or yeah, the, the democracy had won that, that that socialism, communism, had finally you know been defeated, or at least a big part of it had been defeated, and there was a sense of of hope in the air at the time, and you could kind of feel it in the in the way that the song plays. It's just it, it's very. I mean, it's a, it's a really nice ballad, and it talks about the, obviously the winds, wind of change, because that's a period in which we saw a lot of things happening. So, I mean, it's, it's not it wasn't it wasn't a change from one day to the next. Yes, the Berlin Wall fell, but there was a lot of rebuilding that had to be done at the time, and you know the reunification of East and West Germany, and you know. They were Germans on both sides, but they had grown up or they had grown to become very different people culturally because the West Germans would have been totally 100 percent capitalist and, you know, and done manufacturing, done all sort of things. And and the East Germans would have been kind of grown up or lived in a system where they were given. And so they didn't have that experience of going out to, you know, hustling and trying to make a living. They were expecting the government to provide for them, and you know it was, it was a rough transition for a lot of the former Soviet Union members to be reintegrated back into the European system. And so the weird thing is that a lot of these countries did reintegrate, but Russia has been left out again. <laughs> and so that's why you know now we're kind of finding ourselves in the situation where they're kind of treated as the big bad Soviet Union but they're not they're not they're not at the level that they used to be you know they're they're not um they're not trying to take over the world they're just trying to take a small piece of what was once theirs and what and I guess you, you kind of I'm not going to debate that part of it of of whether they're right to do it or not that's besides the point the the point is that the threat uh, that we had before is not the same threat that we have now, but it could escalate, right? Uh, I think ultimately Putin and the Russians still want to be part of Europe. And I think Europe is just being snobbish about letting them back in. And we're not helping in the United States. We're not helping with with that. Uh, well, see, I said back in, but they're, they never were allowed, right? They're never part of the club. So I have some sympathy for the Russians, but at the same time, you know, I I, I don't agree with uh, them going to war. But again, you know, we, they've been kind of pushed into this in a way because there was a stalemate, and the idea was basically it's like you guys don't expand NATO, and we're fine. And uh, NATO decided, you know what? We're gonna add another country and another country, and and so they've slowly been encroaching into that territory, that the Russians were were saying no, no, stop, pull back, you know, just we had an agreement, we had a deal here, and NATO has been kind of reneging on that deal and and expanding. Obviously, the more people that you have to defend, the more you grow, the more money there is, you know, and so and so on. So I don't know. I think we've been pushed into this uh, conflict in Ukraine and the conflict with Russia. Uh, they've been made out to be the bad guys. I don't think they're totally innocent. Uh, you know, they're playing along with this thing, and I think it's kind of paranoid that they wouldn't want NATO to ex to expand because if they have no intention of invading or doing anything like anything nefarious, then it really wouldn't matter. You know, the best way to point out the uselessness of NATO would be to allow them to expand and then nothing happen. You know. Um, but I can see also that it could be an existential threat to Russia because at some point maybe the NATO countries would want to invade Russia. And so from that standpoint, I can see that. But it's a far cry from where we were back in the 90s uh, when I, I suppose when I came of age and this song was was kind of the uh, the anthem of hope of that we had survived, you know, uh, a, the evil empire and had become part of a, a world where there could be peace and there could be, uh, you know, that as the song says, that we could be so close like brothers. 
Um, I don't know. That, that's that's my experience. And when I think about this song, and this song also has another another significance, is that it was also very popular at the time. And when I did go to Europe, and so uh, it had a bit more significance for me in that case because I could see some of what the world that we're part of the world that we were talking about. Obviously, I didn't go to Russia, but <laughs> but I did go to Berlin, and I could at least see some of what uh what that was all about so i don't know i guess i'd be glad to to entertain any questions or thoughts that you have on on the matter is like what do you remember if you're a gen xer about that era of uh, of the the late um, 1980s early 1990s when russia or the soviet union fell and russia was starting and the uh, former countries former soviet countries started to separate and reform into something new something that we have today what was your what were your observations what were your feelings at those times uh, i'd be glad to uh, to hear your thoughts all right that wraps it up for today's episode for national podcast post month episode three uh do come back again and uh, tomorrow is election day so i definitely would have to talk about the election uh or as uh, a local chinese restaurant commercial you'd say would say uh, presidential erections uh this was back in the day of of bill clinton uh, so pres- presidential erections were <laughs> were a big thing back then well thanks for listening we'll talk to you again soon <laughs>